Global India Network. Print, TV, events, podcasts. Find out more at globalindianseries.com. Welcome back to the Global Indian Podcast, home to the greatest conversations and the official platform for open and liberal minds. Because yes, let's face it, we are everywhere. Now, as you know, every week we plunge ourselves into the human experience behind our perceptions of identity, take a second look at the countries we now call home, and tackle the big conversations. Well, this week, I find myself virtually traveling through the interiors of India to understand more about the dynamic duo we are rescoping and rechanging the way in which we look at sports, but more importantly, we question this whole notion of identity. But before then, a quick note from our dear sponsors. If you want to find out more about the Global Indian Series, by the way, well, it couldn't be easier. Simply come to the website, which is www.globalindianseries.com. There you can listen to this podcast and the entire repertoire of discussion so far. Hi, this is Dharmesh Shingala, co-founder of Novus. At Novus, we believe technology leads the way for a meaningful change. We are on a mission to change the way corporations, governments, and institutions interact with information. Same as the Global Indian Podcast, help people transform for a better future. Find out more on how we are inspiring global change, either at the Global Indian Series website or Novus website to learn more about our innovative software solutions. From our family to yours, I hope you enjoy the show. Thank you. My name is Chitra Stern, and I am a proud Global Indian Ambassador and CEO of Martignal Resorts and Martignal Residences. We pride ourselves on the journeys that define a community, and our developments bring people together. Did you know that over 70,000 people just like us call Portugal home? The Global Indian Journey has brought people together in a meaningful way, and on behalf of all of us at Martignal, we want to thank you for joining us in these remarkable conversations. We look forward to seeing you here in Lisbon post-COVID. Hi, my name is Divya and I'm co-founder of the Global Indian Podcast. Before you get to today's show, I've got a quick favour to ask. If you've been enjoying our conversations, I'd love if you could take just one minute to leave us a review on the platform that you're listening to us on and share our work to friends and family. It helps us out a lot. Word of mouth is the primary way that we grow. Thanks for your continued support. So without further ado, let me introduce the two incredible human beings who are kindly supported on this podcast journey by a previous guest of ours and our director for music for the Global Indian Studios, Julius Pakium. Gents, it is nice to see you there in the sunny spots of India, especially especially when I know when I look at my window, it's not going to be anywhere close to that. (laughs) Yes, we are yes. the lucky ones. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are the lucky ones. Um, why don't you quickly introduce yourselves because you got this incredible background behind you as well. Yeah, I mean that's uh, my name is Munish Makija, and uh, this is Ritu Badacharya. Thank you for your kind words of introduction. And this is the rural Maharashtra we live in, where you see the good sun out there, if you can. <laughs> yeah, it, you look you look like you're on set of Jurassic Park, you know, from from the sands and everything. Yeah, yeah, it's but a... we we I'm the dinosaurs. <laughs> it's, it's, more, it's more more like the Avatar uh, <laughs> backdrop with the tribal guys running around. You know, oh, we, we learn man. from these guys. They they're unbelievable. <laughs> um, because because you guys actually live in the tribal communities, don't you? Over there, yes, 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 we do. So, so the the academy is about seventy kilometers out of uh, Bombay now, called Mumbai, and yeah. um, it's uh, in in the Western Ghats, which is one of the oldest uh, mountain ranges of the world. Yes, these, the is. The these hills are about sixty five million years old. You know, like they predate the Himalayas. So the history of these hills is ridiculous. What they the knowledge this these valleys hold is unbelievable and these tribals are sitting 70 kilometers away from bombay which is 40 million people you know and they don't know about it they are living in the like you know like they're tribals they are like the like like the central island tribals they're the tribals of maharashtra they don't want to go to the highway or to the city or they don't even know the ocean is 50 kilometers away and they run away from the doctors they, they, run in, they used to they run in, into the forest when you know we used to come in in the beginning and you know when the first people who came and connected with them and today we have a sports academy over here <laughs> with interior you know so it's it's a 
we're living in an alternate world actually yeah. <laughs> before before we get into sports academy why don't you run the audience through your backgrounds because you you know from from dealing with squash on the highest levels through to music on the other side to almost kind of going to these interiors there's almost a story within the story there yeah so i mean let me just give you a little b- brief background of i was born brought up in delhi again like it was an overgrown village when i was growing up out there uh, because yeah when I mean, there was no television to start with and we used to survive on radio so i was always outdoors and enjoying life and trying to get into sports then into school was good at track and field events and then the opportunities of life where i was growing up was either you get into a government service a lawyer doctor engineer or armed forces uh, these were the choices that were there to uh, do whatever you else you want to do in life sports was considered like man you're not going to get a government job also so don't you go there so but um, i kept on trying trying and then i found out that the system out there of sports out here or or for that matter that the institutions were very far off for me to reach and practice for track and field there used to be a stadium that's far off how would i reach there there was no uh, what you call it kind of uh, uh, sponsorships were not there and the, neither scholarships were there so you had to fend for yourself coming from a middle class background i felt sports was is i have to leave it because that is not going to give me my bread and butter so i left sports and went into various other professions in life including investigative journalism to opening lounge bar in goa to music to uh, choreography. to choreography and everything because i was trying to find out uh, find my way like where when am i going to reach what i want to reach where i want to reach and i could not find satisfaction in most of the professions so i used to get bored leave it bored leave it but at the same time sports which i wanted to do in my life always remained inside me so when after doing my journey into all the metropolitans and living that static life of same uh, shit different day i would say so i got bored and i just got I had got married and i told my ex wife that i want to like kind of get out of this uh, so called uh, vertical living concrete uh, jungle concrete jungle so yeah. we started looking for a place and we found this little valley out here which i thought because i was working in the music field producing music for background scores for films and getting uh, artists from pakistan rad fateh ali khan was introduced by me in india so i got bored of that and i said i wanted to live in an open space so we found this place and i came here and i saw like the, the difference between the lives which is 70 kilometers away and the difference out here where uh, when i came here there was no electricity uh, in the village so they were living under those little lamps and candle lights and somebody had a torch and stuff like that so then i decided like man and and i was just like since i was outdoor i was just playing with the kids tribal kids and i saw this little girl who was playing this football with me and uh, all the kids were running and all and we had a had a lake so i kicked it and the uh, the ball went into the lake this girl just went running out of the thing jumped into the lake got the ball again started playing i said what's what's your name she said my name is of course she didn't speak in english that time yeah. so she said my name is bijli bijli means electricity yeah, yeah, yeah. i said oh man this is like and then she had a little uh, thing on her forehead i thought this is a bindi or something that she's put but then i saw it was a tattoo so i said who got this done she said that's my mom who got it done and it's like a banyan tree little tattoo that was there so i found this girl fascinated and as i said let me just uh, i got a little meaning of what i was trying to do all my life is like if i could not get into the sports let me just get this girl going into sports because education is not giving them anything because hardly there are any schools which are providing them with good education some people, parents don't send their kids to the school and that's how i started pushing her and then ritvik came in and ritvik will tell you his part of the journey reaching yeah yeah because ritvik you are a squash player weren't you yeah <laughs> run, run me through your story because now, now i've got all these images of a girl running around tattoo it is very avatar like i have to say yeah. um, <laughs> run, run me through your side how did you get here 
So, so what Munnar didn't add is that he also was one of the top VJs back in the 90s in India, where the whole concept of MTV and Channel V came in. He was Udham Singh. So yeah. he was one of the first VJs. And if he'd been the same VJ today, he would have had billions of followers. Like, you know, so yeah. it, it, we were in the, he's been about 20 years ahead of his time, for sure, since I met him at least. And he, he's quite a visionary because of him we are here today, you know, because I uh, came in here, I've been playing, you know, my dad was in the Indian Air Force. He was a fighter pilot. So I was in these small rural bases outside the cities. I've grown up in the country, like, you know, and with a lot of sports facilities and a squash court, a tennis court, a swimming pool and things like that. So my childhood was outdoors away from school, uh, running off from school and playing different sports. And then I went to the Rashtriya Indian Military College, which was before 1922, the Prince of Wales Royal Indian Military College uh, in Dehradun. It's a school yeah. which is only from class 8 to class 12. So they had a lot of squash over there and I started doing really well in squash over the other sports because I was playing everything. You know, I was in the cricket team because you got to go out of boarding school. I was in the boxing team. I was in the squash team. And then squash, suddenly I got into the national circuit and I did really well in it. And I was number one in India by the time I left school, you know, in men's, in the open category. And <laughs> so then it was a decision of, should I join the armed forces like my father and fly a fighter jet, which was also lovely. But I'd seen it since a child. Or should I try, I walk on this uh, non-secure path of being a professional athlete in a kind of obscure sport like squash and travel the world. But for me, it was really exciting to, you know, what I wanted to do was not be obviously be the best player I could be, but it was, you know, dominate that time India or the world of squash was dominated by the Jahangir Khans and the Jansher Khans and, you know, uh, the Pakistani players. And I was like, why is there no Indian in the top 100 in the world in squash? So that's, a, a, a you know, it's as patriotic as it can be. And I said, let's go and, you know, search this. And for the first two years on the world tour, even though I was number one in India, I lost every match in qualifying only. And, you know, but I was in South America playing and I was like, I'm 18 years old. This is fantastic. Fast forward to 20 years more of playing on the world tour and, you know, breaking the top 50 and representing India at the Commonwealth Games where squash was introduced in Manchester. Then staying in England and uh, playing uh, with Neil Harvey, who was the coach to the then world champion, Peter Nickel. I, then I travelled all over and trained with many other coaches in France and Egypt and things like that. So, I mean, I had the most amazing time. And then I... I I was disappointed with squash because I trained hard for the 2010 Commonwealth Games for four years and I didn't make the team for because of politics, you know. So I was like, you know, screw squash. <laughs> Let's see what else is there to do. And I gave up squash at 31 on the World Tour because I wasn't enjoying it. The body was breaking down. I had sacrificed too much while growing up. And I said, now the, there's a time when you know inside you, you know, if you're not enjoying it, you can't keep doing it. You know, for me, work is tough. Play is fun. You know, I've always played yeah. my whole life. And then I came and uh, came to Bombay, uh, did a TV show called Fear Factor in Brazil. Uh, so suddenly what I didn't do in my whole squash career, the, the TV show came and paid me so much money. That I was like, man, there's the universe is uh, there. You know, there, yeah. someone is watching. And then I came to India and I met Munna. Uh, who said, oh, I'm living out of Bombay in this farm. And I was like, man, I'm done with this city. It's too, <laughs> there's too much going on. There's too much noise. I, I, you know, I can't, I'm not being able to breathe here. So one Saturday morning, I got on the bike and came, and, you know, he just told me I live so-and-so at this place. And I turned up at his gate. And though I know him from before, but this is the first time I came to this valley and I came and saw this place and what he had done over here because he's been here now 20 years. At that time, 10 years in 2011. And... Um, I was like, man, Muna, what are you doing over here? How, what is this world you created and what is going on? And these are really tribal kids. And then I came back every weekend after that till I started coming in the week as well. And then he, after my third trip, I said, Muna, he's like, there's a space over here where we can make a nice squash academy. Is that what you want to do? And I was like, not really at that. I was 31. I didn't really want to make the academy. I wanted to go more towards helping the Indian team and you know developing the structure of the national team. But I was like, you know, wh why not? Because the worst thing you can do is make an infrastructure and it's not being used. But mm -hmm. because there's a tribal village touching the land which Muna was showing me, which is on a lake on one side and it's a tribal village on the other side. And I was like, how has no one taken this land? And he then said, no one wants to live next to the tribal village. You know, don't, they don't even want to make their farmhouse over here. 
So I was like, this is perfect for the Scotch Academy because at least even if there's no national juniors here training with me in a retreat or in a uh, um, immersive camp, which we do over here, which is a res residential camp, we'll have the tribal kids using the court. And today, uh, six years later, we have the second court coming up. We have 62 kids from this village who are, who are pulverizing everybody in Scotch. Who are playing on the national circuit. They're ranked. <laughs> There is one kid who's 10 years old who is number two in India in the under 11 category. Uh, there's, a, there's a girl who's top 16 in India, Bijli, the same girl who Muna saw. She is number 16 in India playing on the PSA World Tour. She's 318 in the world. And she's played, uh, she's flown to Delhi, she's flown to Chennai, she's flown to Dehradun. She's played in tournaments uh, with international players in the last five years. This is, And we have a whole army behind them of now, um, 11, I mean, 16 kids in the under 11 category, 16 young girls who are 9, 8, 9 and 10 years old playing squash. Five years ago, they didn't even know what squash was. You know? <laughs> while doing, and while doing this, we realized that uh, when in, in a thing that uh, the like I what I faced when I was growing up, like in terms of the where to go and practice for track and field and all that. While these results were uh, coming out, me and Ritwik came about something which is a so-called blueprint or a philosophy. We say like the institutions are very far off, away from the people who want to learn. So we have to bring the institutions to their doorsteps. So yeah. that's how like kind of we thought about it and now the results are coming. And and just to finish, I know I know we've been, I mean, you know, I've been going on, but just to finish the point, uh, uh, the... Then came boxing because we were like, you know, squash is good, but it's not a development sport. It's an elite sport. We need to develop these kids. So we were doing football. We were doing um, some karate classes. The idea was to expose them as much as possible rather than say, no, you only have to play squash. And, yeah. you know, there are many academies in India, but what they, were, what they all are doing is they're only looking at the kid for the two, three hours which they come for the sport. And then yeah. they go back to their houses, sometimes which is two, three hours away from the academy. Yeah. You know, yeah. so here the village was right next door. Their parents, the kids' parents, were working with us as admin staff, housekeeping, maintaining the courts, and you know, cooking and things like that. They created a lot of jobs for them. So we we yeah. now sort of have about hundred people from this village of seven hundred people, sort of a uh, part of the academy, supporting it right there. You know, from all, and all ages. From the grandparents to who know Muna from 20 years yeah. and to the parents who are working with the academy. We have 22 staff people working at the academy to the first generation of kids who started with us six years ago with Bijli being the, the leader and then the Sada, Raju, Naresh, Krishna. The Out of those 12 first kids, six of them have left. Some of them are working at the animal shelter, but six have been retained now. And then the, every generation, there were another 12 kids. So year two into 2018, another 12 kids came. 2019, another nine, eight, 10 kids came. And now suddenly in the COVID happened. So we keep, kept these kids training and it was like the world had shut down, but these kids were able to play in their yeah. bubble. Yeah. And no one else in the world was playing squash. So their improvement for two years was ridiculous, you know, because yeah, I was absolutely. staying here, that was here. And that's when we introduced boxing into the village. And we got some pro boxers. We'd already been working on the national boxing circuit, the pro boxing circuit, doing events for them. And we did the biggest boxing event in Goa. So this was the academy. This was the academy that we... Uh, then we started the boxing academy next to the squash academy, which is where Munna's whole... Uh, he's based at the boxing academy. And it's B-O-X... S I N G H. Boxing <laughs> Academy. <laughs> oh, that's so, and, then, and then, because boxing was struggling internationally and the Indian Boxing Federation was banned from world boxing, yeah. the boxers sort of lost interest as well. And we, this is a finishing school for pro boxers how to manage them like a, like a Don King. But good Don King, yeah. but manage boxers, you yeah, know. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. And exactly. and then yeah. Munna was here alone in lockdown. He was like, "Man, this boxing, where is it going? The tribal kids, they're training. The boxing, the squash is going well, but where is boxing going? Where we invested a lot of time and effort and our own funds." And he started punching on the bag on his own, saying, "Screw it! If the kids don't want to train, I'll punch on my own." And we put some music on, and then you know he did this for two three months. And suddenly, back beat emerged because we recorded one session, the audio, just the audio. And then we put it on. We were sitting upstairs after training. 
And the, the Munna said, let's just put that uh, recording on. And we put it on and there was a sound. organic new sound which came out of it. It was like, tap, 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 yeah. tap, tap. And from there, Buckwheat was born. So that was the... Because it's, it's quite know, tribal, really... isn't it? Because when, you, when I saw the videos and saw the work that you do, it feels that like you got these drums that are playing, but it's not. It's, it's you guys punching against the bag and you got a community of people now that are doing yes. this. And look at the yes. videos. It's almost like the next Zumba of the world because people are sweating profusely. You know, everyone's yes. getting into shape. They're allowed to get the rhythms in there, but it has a deeper impact because I think that there's this connection between the way that people feel, the way that you exercise, and then also seeing how you can generate rhythms. Before we get onto back bark beat, what has this whole experience taught you about what it means to be human? Because you've almost left these, like you've, you've lived multiple worlds within one world and it's probably like 70 kilometers away from each other yeah. when you think of yeah. it. I mean, uh, I mean, I think like uh, sometimes uh, what you need, to, one needs to understand is that you cannot just only what you want to do in life, like I would say, like I wanted to be a track and field guy. We'd seen Carl Lewis and Ben Johnson, so I would like want to go there. But then you have at some point you have to realize that you have lost that opportunity of time now. But at the same time, you keep seeking for your kind of people or kids who need the opportunity. So that's the basic part that attracted me to be here. Like you have to, if you can't get it, that doesn't mean you don't provide for somebody else. So that's the kind of thought that held me out here. And then I kept on working with kids and boxing and all those things. That's my my way of looking at life. So, and for me, it's been more that, you know, I love the idea that everyone helps everyone. And for, uh, to be a good sportsman, if you can teach straight away what you learned from your coach today, and give back to the next generation, you'll improve faster because what Absolutely. you know, you, if you teach it, you know it. If yeah. you learn it, you might understand it in theory, but to teach it, you have to know it. So that's what we've done. Now we don't only have 62 kids in the village, we have 62 coaches yeah. and trainers and backbeat instructors and they, because they've done everything. Everyone is doing everything. The oldest generation of kids, Sada, Bijli, Naresh, Raju, I would do a session with them. Within two days, the whole academy is doing it. All kids, their kids who are turning up now from this village. I mean, we just got the last batch of 12 who are all 8, 9, 10. I've never hit with them. They're playing proper squash. They do a boast drive. They know how to score. They know how to count. They know how to give a let, a stroke. They, they're going for tour. It's, it's, it's like there's a there's a energy which, I mean, this is, they didn't know English. They didn't know Hindi. They didn't know Marathi. They were speaking yeah. a dialect of Marathi. Yeah. Today, the, we have a French coach over here, Stefan who's taught them the movement because I went to his coach and learned. And he doesn't know Hindi. He only knows broken English, French and Italian. And they know the movement because they're observing and they no one has ever exp experimented with the tribal community, which and is a getting, vast they're community. Getting, they're getting educated by this because now they're speaking in English. How many tribal villages, Mana, you told me the other day? In uh, India? 1,45,000 tribal villages. In, in India. India. Okay, so 145... Wow. Uh, thousand villages yeah. <laughs> yeah. and out of it, each village will have at least thousand kids you know and we look at that that whole community sitting there we've never experimented that an elite sport with hand-eye coordination like squash or even boxing these kids would be good at but they are actually avatar kids what i wanted to end over here with Munna, to add to Munna's point was that i have learned so much being over here i know that i am the corruption so I have to give as much good to live here harmoniously with nature and these people who have been living here for centuries, thousands of years, not knowing Bombay is over here. Then when I come in over here, there's definitely a negative impact. But because I can see the squash and Munna can see different people, we are trying to limit that and give them a quantum jump because today well, proudly... What, what, are some, these... what, are those, what are some of those impacts? Because that's really interesting. It's, it's this whole notion that we think when we live in the cities, when we live in the big world, that we're doing everything right. But as you rightly said, you're like we're part of nature, you know. So the yeah. moment that you guys left that and observed yourself and almost immersed yourself in nature is almost that deconditioning. So what is yeah. it that you left behind when you left the city? 
the sound. Mentally, of the, 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 the sound. The, 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 the sound, the, we left the noise, the cacophony, the too many ideas. The idea of someone living above you, 10 stories up and below you, 10 stories down. Because I feel it, and Muna actually told me this when I moved here, that the to have your feet touching the ground and the, no nothing between you and the, and the sky is what you need to do when you sleep. Now, if yeah. people are sleeping above you, then that many more energies are coming into you every day. You know, yeah. so we don't have that. We live uh, in a very open way. You know, we are living. Um, I'll show you at, towards the end where we are living. You know, and we have an amazing freshwater lake. We have waterfalls over here in the rainy season. To be sitting here is like you're sitting in Switzerland in in you know in, in bliss. And it's a very stark change because it's very rocky volcanic rock. So it yeah. gets hot as well and it gets cold as well, but all in between 20 uh, or say 15 degrees to about 30 degrees, 35 at max. Humidity is high. So we have amazing weather. We don't have the extreme cold. We don't have the extreme heat. We have fresh water. We are very privileged. We have freshest, the freshest air possible. We have a small microclimate with its own uh, flora and fauna. I mean, it is ridiculous. And we are living 70 kilometers with all the... All the benefits, <laughs> all the benefits of a so city. From, from now on, the global yeah. Indian series moves. <laughs> it's going to be the yes, you have to. <laughs> we, so will, we'll, we will not give anybody any choice. We'll have to. And now <laughs> that, you know, more or less it's been decided that Wi Fi is a fundamental right. So the whole village is given Wi Fi to. We formed a foundation and a trust. The whole village has Wi Fi. They don't have to use your mobile data. And the, the squash court is a community center where they can come in. There's no wall between the academy and the village. The, they are using the loose. So the changes that have come across because of sport and yeah. Education because of is coming. excellence in sport being the focus, they are educated. Their civic sense is better. They know how to use a toilet. They know how to go in a car to the city. They know how to behave in a club. They know how to be comfortable take flight, there take a flight take a flight go and stay one of Bijli <laughs> went in the middle of lockdown to chennai to play a world tour event she spent 5 days locked up in a in a in, a, in the radisson over there you know or the marriott yeah. i think it was and it was one of, she almost gave up squash because but we had another coach who was staying in the next room so then now that things are opened up she's the opening out because these kids don't want to leave this valley you know their mentality is they generationally they've never left they only go into the forest they get their wood, they farm the farm, make basic crops only for three months in the year, and they live off the land. Yeah, they and some crabs, they so, do so, so we 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 all think we are superior, but they are superior. Yeah. We have to learn from them. We can't just because we're educated and we've and got the, exposure, and, think that they are so inferior. And that equality and inclusion being the mantra, we have to include everyone. We can't have our own kids and say, oh, these kids will get more special treatment. And today, honestly, hand on my heart, Muna, me, our whole team, we look at city kids coming, we look at the tribal kids, and we can't see a difference. Yeah. We, we treat everyone the same. They sit on the same table. They eat together with the outside kids. They Now, as soon as the outside kids come in and say, oh, these kids are tribal, we say, okay, tomorrow morning, you, you all go on for a trek to the top of the hill. And by the time they're back from that track, they, they, you know, these kids man. are all in the same, uh, you know, place. Yeah. There's respect, mutual respect, you know. And yeah. that's what so we want to balance. What we keep trying is what Ritwik spoke earlier about was that we don't want even these kids, kids to get corrupted. And we are the source of the corruption because sometimes while playing, Ritwik would just, or because or whatever, would well, yeah, shit, man, this racket or whatever. Yeah. So we don't want them to learn that. We want them to be <laughs> like that. So some kids started doing that. So he said, Hey man, you just got a racket and you're trying to throw it away. You didn't know so, what squash was. How so, are you throwing a racket? So, so it yeah. realized that the outside kids coming in, we had to choose who came in. So we got army kids. We got kids from different backgrounds to come and train with them. They were coming for their squash. So we got pro boxers from Punjab. We got Punjabi music in with them. Yeah. We did boxing camps. We've done NLP camps in Marathi with them. We've done yoga camps. We've done karate camps. <laughs> uh, you know, we're doing breathwork classes with them. So things are... We can't decide what is good, you know. We have to give when, all when the exposure because possible, obviously they all will be champions in their own way. Because people are listening in from this right the way across the globe, and they hear about this incredible ecosystem that you built. But this doesn't happen for free. It's about building up sustainable practices. Now, coming into Barkbeat, Barkbeat, you've kind of originated this new sport on the back of frustration, and now all of a sudden you're you're on the precipice 
or something that could actually be a not just a India wide phenomenon, but essentially could actually help a lot of people. Because when I was having a look at the tech and we were speaking about this, we thought actually this this could be great for kids who suffer from autism. It could be great for mental health. Run me through Bark B and then how are you creating a sustainable future for India? Because as much as everyone's talking about the Adanis of the world or the Reliances of the world for various different reasons, mind you, um, when you hear about what you guys are doing, it feels like it's true mix of philanthropy with corporatization. And it's such a fantastic idea. Yeah, I mean, let me just take you through Bagbeat as in terms of we thought about it and once the sport was kind of born in our heads, then we tried it, then we said, okay, okay now, uh, this could be another form of break dancing. I mean, I mean the aggression that people have, the, it could tone down the aggression in the society. I mean, rather than going and getting into a fight, you could say, okay, there are two bags, you punch, how much you punch, and I punch, whoever wins, we just bow to each other and go. So we thought about a lot of angles. Yeah, I mean, because, I mean, they're coming in India and the way the atmosphere is, there's a lot of, uh, social unrest in terms of whether it's casteism, whether it's religious beliefs or whatever. So I, we thought about it and we said like this could be a melting point of even cultures because music is an integral part of it. And a lot of music which we could introduce to uh, the world which is indigenous out here and a lot of uh, indigenous people who are making this music could listen to the world music. And eventually, when you hear things together, when you do things together, there comes a certain kind of harmony in an overall sense. So we that's where we thought Bagbeat is very, very essential for kids, for athletes, for rehabilitation centers, for, like you said, autism, for even, uh, I would say, old age homes. I mean, like, eventually, you just have, don't have to punch. You can move in harmony with each other, that also so... I mean, it has got a huge, huge potential. And at the same time, when you said, how are we? We are not the Adani Zambanis or some other NIs of the world. But uh, we, we don't have the money. But I think the will to do something is more important than money. So we are kind of uh, telling people this is what it is. And we'll see where it goes. So we're not going to give it up. Since we're not Adani's, we're not going to give it up. <laughs> yeah, but but it's but what's interesting though is that no, just to just so let let me let me uh, let me also jump in here. Box Bark Beat is an acronym. Boxing, B A R K. Boxing and rhythm, rhythm combined, combined combined with the K. Beats creates, yeah. creates a yeah. beat. So you know, and uh, the the main idea behind Bark Beat was that we don't train our sound at all in anything. Yeah. We are very visually training our kids. And if, and Munna, I also mentioned about his childhood. If I, because I've been doing Bark Beat for a year and a half now, and you know, must have done more than at least 200,000, 300,000 punches uh, per year. So we've done more punches than anyone else. But if a 10 year old kid is getting this training and for two years, and we've done that with the, with the tribal kids as well, and I'm yeah. seeing the change in them, we've done it with some of the pro boxers and national squash players. They can be super athletes because if your sound is in sync, today what happens with a kid, especially in India, is either you're musically inclined, you go into music and learn the music instruments and things like that. If you're not musically inclined, music is taken out. So there's no sound training ever again in your life. You know, you miss the music class and now you're playing sport, you're studying, you're doing everything else. No one is training you on your sound. So you become handicapped in a way. Now, if you understand beat and you can really hear music and sound and you really can punch on rhythm, your timing is right, then that can be good. So even if you are like a 100 meter sprinter, it'll be take your mark set and the gun goes. Oh. Now, if you're visually trained, yeah. you'll see everyone else go and then you uh, start. But even in squash, in an all glass court, you, the the sound of the other person hitting, Absolutely. if it hits That's... the side wall, it's a boast. Is a bang bang double sound. So you know the ball's going there, and you look there and you find it. You can't not hear if you just look for the ball, you can't see it. So your sound is your number one survival instinct, your number one sense. And we don't train it at all, really. You know, and you, see, and you can so, hear it in uh, the sound in the uh, in your mother's womb also, but you can't yeah. see. Yeah, that, yeah. So that's so that's so, your so, primal primal uh, thing. Yeah. So synchronized swimming is there, there's rhythmic gymnastics. So we thought about something in a, where, you know, you take the brutality out of sport 
out of boxing either you love boxing or you hate boxing because of the brutality you yeah. take that out so all the people who don't even like boxing will love bakbi and and it's a sport for mixed gender everyone you can punch with your mother you can punch with your father you can punch with your son you can punch with your sister you can punch with in your class with someone synchronized so you by the end of 30 minutes of punching will be both on the same wavelength otherwise yeah. the bag will gong i mean i will move out of circumference so and, and it's and it's a great over. and it's a great way to build up that mutual trust because you're right it's you are on the same wavelength and it's it's almost as what you said before it's the human brain is adapted not just to be visually and you you spoke for speaking about nlp neuro linguistic programming but it's also about your auditory functions because that's who we are we're primal so we need to be able to see the world we need to be able to hear the world but we also need to be able to feel the world so our kinesthetic abilities and what you've done incredibly well is that you combined all these things in a way that makes it more suitable for the societies that we live in now you told me um that 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 when you left boxing when you left uh, squash you put on a bit of weight and you said since being bumpy you've lost this extraordinary amount of kilos within space a year and a half how much have you actually lost i feel like this is a uh, i was i was up to i was up to about 98 kilos lockdown had happened as well so i started the journey back i mean you know i i am not a gym person i did go to the gym when i was playing professional sport the yeah. day i stopped I didn't feel like going to the gym again because I didn't yeah. care what I looked like, you know. Yeah. I didn't care how many abs I had. I've already uh, played sport my whole life. I'm fit, you know. Yeah. And uh, so I used to swim when I could. I used to surf, dive, but there was no physical. I would play sport. I would play with the kids. But when now I when I play squash, I only break my body down more and yeah. create more imbalance because one side is working more. Already sh- the sh- the sh- whole sh- body is sh- taken. insane yeah. amount of pounding on the the sprung flows so you know uh, the 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 body was breaking down and now playing the kids i would break it down further there was no way to get fit to play squash or use squash to get fitter yeah. and then so i would swim a lot in the lake and you know i would maybe walk around a bit jog a bit but i don't like running that much either you know yeah, yeah. i've already done enough running in my life and then bakweed has come along and you know it's got all the elements it's it's anti gym You know, you don't yeah. need a gym anymore. You have four punching bags in a in a room. You can have the best workout ever. You can, you know, instead of counting steps, you're counting thirty thousand punches. Munar just did the other day. He did thirty two thousand punches in a session. You know, so in, which in is which session. is a world record. So yeah, it's a world record. We and how, and how long we was that? Munar, how long how long was that session? Was that a half hour or two hours ten minutes? So and at fifty ten minutes, yeah, two hours ten minutes. Yeah. But if you get into the music, you put two sets on, you know. And fast, I should. I send you the video. I've recorded it. You know, the good thing about Bakbeat is we've recorded because of these lovely phones. We've recorded everything, you know. And and I know. Hang on, hang on. Thirty-two thousand punches in ten minutes. Thirty-two thousand punches in two hours. Twenty-two in two hours and ten minutes. He said. Yes. So it's approximately you can say about three punches in a second. Yeah, that's almost like a manga movie. Do you remember like that Fist of the North Star type of stuff yeah. that you used to watch, right? It's um, <laughs> Amanda, yeah. with your with your newly um, Muna is a character from there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the future? What's the future that you want to have for Barkbeat? Because obviously, what what motivates it isn't just finances. I think what motivates it is making societal change. It's this whole idea of community custodianship. Let's get better together. So yeah, it's, what, what I think it's like yeah for me it is uh, not about money for me I think this sport can actually break all the boundaries of the world in terms of geographical boundaries because of the culture melting points of music different people coming together and playing together so I would say it could break a lot of barriers with uh, without I would say aggression so I think I would. Uh, i think this would bring about a huge huge social change all across that's what is uh, uh my kick in the bark beat it's not about how well it does and money and all that's a by product that will again eventually since as i said yeah. i believe in a benevolent capitalism kind of thing yeah. i mean i'm going to eat that much only what i'm going to store this much for so yeah. the rest will go wherever it has to go and and you know again we are sort of experimenting because we have a captive audience of these tribal kids who are who, rather than making them do ridiculous amount of training which is squash 
centric or boxing centric this is a really good substitute it's an all in one program and then we did a we've done two tournaments for the tribal kids where we oh, made yeah. them make four teams yeah. and one was a four captains were chosen and they chose their four other three other players with one substitute and the second one was the girls versus the boys because the girls we've been training them to do a performance on a music uh, on the bark beat anthem which muna has created uh, um, which is one of his main so we were getting them to do a performance for the village only and then we made the boys who would sort of not train that much say okay you take on the girls team the girls team hammered the boys team it was like some 3200 punches in the same song and the boys were 900 punches you know because they trained for 8 days you know so <laughs> the, it seems the, to the, me that you can't kids, so now now so many things have happened with these kids who have changed in so many ways they don't look tribal anymore they, they don't they, behave they, tribal they, anymore bijli, you know? now bijli named her team i don't know where she got the name from so so what do you, because you said you guys make a team and get a name for yourself so somebody said naresh warriors and this and that and bijli came up with a name called boomers and i was like oh bijli you like that girl who yeah. got boomers so she had a thing and then we said okay now when you make a team when you're going to punch on this bag you also have to have a cause what are you punching for you want punching for world peace to whatever so you'll get certain kind of punches upgraded because of the choice of the name choice of the song and why are you punching so we get them so they uh, bijli she says i am punching for women empowerment it was like we got it recorded and i was saying where is this girl getting these words from boomer women empowerment <laughs> so we've done our job man if you look it's, at it it's like it's like you've almost put people in this conscious flow it's like where you live is what you said if i if my stomach can only hold that much what's the point of storing it and you and you're able to think like that because you live somewhere where you have abundance of clean water clean air you have the forest is right there and you have fruit and veg that's grown so ultimately what you've done and i like this whole idea of the anti gym because you're saying actually sports is not just a recreational activity it's who we are as human beings we're we are born to move and so yeah. therefore if we're born to move it is absolutely absurd that we only spend an hour or maybe even less than that outside i think some of the recent figures that came out was the average adult only spends 14 minutes outdoors in sunshine oh, which is absolutely terrible. shocking and it, 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 it's only 14 minutes of sunshine anyway yeah, yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> it's true it's true it's true it's true it's um it's, it's, it's what's a sun i thought it's a lamp post you know it's um but it's but it's interesting if people want to find out more about barkbeat if people want to find out more about the work that you do where do they go where do they get this information uh, so man we we are we are we are a little underground in our thought process the idea is to make champions of these kids and yeah. then you know go out to the world and say this is a good model because we don't want to make 100 centers you want to make just yeah. this center properly and then record it well let everyone know that this is an opportunity because sports can bring about change which all the you know big foundations of the world the unicef yeah. and everyone's going to do is they're trying to get civic sense and health and this and that and it's all coming into a dole space you know where you're just giving it out for free and then the, the yeah. kids get used to that as opposed to when you put sports into it all those objectives get met you know yeah. you the kids become better they dress properly they present themselves well today the tribal kids are living a little bit of a dual life when i saw these same girls these 17 girls go for a tournament and i happened to drop into the tournament in bombay these girls were dressed differently they were looking like different so when they come back to the village they're a little dressed down and in their normal clothes but they all in these three fourth sort of uh, you know shorts Yeah. and you know which is very unique for them but, but you know when, when when they go out when they come back in is there a mental shift it's like what you said earlier that stuck with me is that do we corrupt what the world is like because we we often see the world as we are not as it is and i think that's what we what we realized here and so when they go out and they come back in what changes happened are they able to live both lives can you see almost a city influencing them because not everything's bad either is it so so two things happened you know one, one was that the initially when we sent five of them out three boys two girls within two days all the other kids had elevated themselves when they, these five came back after a tournament they would all be flying around a bit within five six days everyone was upgraded 
But then once we sent only Bijli and two other girls for one tournament because of the women's tournament, when they came back, there was a little bit of resentment in the village and they pulled all the girls down. We stopped, the girls stopped coming for two months. Then Munan and me sat down and saying, did we do something wrong? You know, then we realized, no, this is a tribal village and there's too many changes. For centuries, they've not even gone to the highway. Now suddenly the girls are flying yeah. for a tournament, dressing differently. They're already, so everyone got jealous and all the boys pulled the girls down. The girls stopped coming. But then we gave it time saying what we're doing is pure and slowly Bijli came back. And I told her, when you come back, you don't have to share everything you do over there. When you win the trophy, then share it, you know. Yeah. And so she sort of uh, only maybe represents half of what she does because you don't want to make everyone jealous saying, oh, you're, you've become too cool now. You're doing this and that. And then now there's a good balance in the system. Now all the other kids are getting to go. We are sending 52 kids for a tournament sometimes to Bombay or Pune, which is about an hour and a half away. They all go in cars. Uh, because they all have matches at different times rather than send them in a bus where they start throwing up. So the idea is to build their confidence yeah. because when one of them, two of them, five of them out of 62 will be champions, national level I, for I, sure. I could speak with you guys yeah, all day. Would. It's but I'm just looking at the timing here. It's um, Okay, people want to find out more. Where do they go? So we have a website called uh, bark, B-A-R-K dash beat.com because barkbeat.com wasn't available. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and Start Foundation, uh, Squash Temple and Rural Training. So startfoundation.in. Yeah. So these are two websites. Uh, they're not the best, but uh, they they give the message. <laughs> we, we do, the really? drivers are working on our website, so it will take some, some time. That is incredible. Gents, you know, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. I really want to come over there now and actually just experience this whole world because it seems to me that you found your joy right at the beginning when you're saying that you're kind of doing so many different careers. It's because you're finding yourself and now you found yourself in a great, amazing place and you're making a social change. And it's, I know there's so many more questions I can ask, but we've run out of time, unfortunately. Yeah, but, um, yeah, man. Like, please come whenever you feel like, whenever you're on this part of the world, please come to... Yeah. You absolutely. need to make a special trip here, for sure. You know? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> I, I'll breathe clean air, drink fresh water. What more yeah. do you need? You know, it's um... we, we also we also grow some of our vegetables and everything that is also in the garden out there. So you can fruits, everything. <laughs> oh man, you know, it's a far cry from where I live. I can tell you that. Um, gents, it's really good to have you on. If people want to find out more, you said it's start foundation dot in, and then you have bark hyphen beat dot yes. com what a fantastic episode i'm sure you agree i think there's something incredibly admirable for the fact that they gave up high-flying careers to find out who they were almost reliving the human experience through their own eyes and now they're giving back to society as a large well i really hope you enjoyed this podcast and that you find out more about bark beat and the incredible founders behind it well until next week i hope all remains well as we continue our journeys of discovering the 50 shades of brand discussions from around the world. Take care for now. Global Indian Network. Print, TV, events, podcasts. Find out more at globalindianseries.com.